So what's the reason for all these complicated formulas? Like, you know, if, uh, if that's it, I can simply say i is equal to mr squared. Why do we have a bunch of uh, these formulas down here that, you know, uh, let me just zoom into one column of them. Like, you know, this is uh, lifted from your textbook. It has, um, um, you know, so for like eight different geometries, there are, um, well, eight different formulas like those. Uh, like, I mean, I don't remember doing this for mass. For mass, when we are talking about mass of an object, we had whatever object it was, we had its mass. We didn't worry about is this object, you know, a cylinder shaped or is it looking like a disk or is it a sphere? We didn't care about that. Um, so uh, why are there so many bunch of different formulas for different geometrical object? As an example, why does it list two different formulas, one for a solid cylinder and one for a thin hoop or thin hoop? If you don't have an answer, that's OK. Let me pose you this question instead. So let me ask you this question. Um, rotational inertia. of a rod. And I know you can just look it up on the other side of the column that's not being projected. But uh, I want to show you how it can be derived. So, so you know, um, for many of the rotation inertias you might use for a problem, you are going to be looking it up. But, um, but I want you to know in principle how to actually derive the rotation inertia. Because you know, the rotation inertia that you see here, it's not an experimental thing. It's something that can be theoretically calculated. And I want you to know the procedure for theoretically calculating it. So let's say somebody asked you, what is the rotation inertia over rod over length L being rotated by its end point? Good. Let me draw that figure here so I have something to look at. Let's say we have a rod. of length L, and I'm choosing to rotate it by one of its end points. So this is my center of rotation, and I'm rotating it um, back and forth either way. Okay? So suppose somebody asked you, what is the rotation inertia? How would you answer that? Or how would you try to answer it? Let me give you a hypothetical answer. Could you say that it's equal to, uh, oh, you would have to know the mass of the thing. So let me give you its mass. Let's say it's a rod of uh, length L, mass n. Could you say that its rotation inertia is its mass times L squared? So why not? Ali, why were you shaking your head? Like, why would this be wrong? Mm hmm. Mm, so you said the L is the whole length, but like you wanted to do this. That doesn't have a correct unit, because uh, the unit. So whatever rotational inertia you have, it'll always have this unit. Um, I'm glad that this got brought up. So um, so this formula gives you one thing for sure. It gives you the unit of rotational inertia. When you look at the unit of rotational inertia, it's going to be kilogram times meter squared, you know, mass times length squared. And when we do this correctly here, we'll, we will also get that unit. Um, but um, I want to highlight something that Ali said, that L is the length of the whole ruler, right? L is the length of the whole ruler. So that is a good place to start. Meaning, if you are trying to apply this formula, this formula is valid at a single point. This formula is valid for this point here. Um, is the ruler, all of the ruler at this point? No, right? Some of the rulers is actually at r equals zero. 
sum of the ruler is at r equals you know, l over 2. If the ruler is spread out over the entire length of the ruler. <laughs> um, so when we ask this question, um, you, you actually, um, so without calculus, you have no way of answering this. Because it comes down to this. It's uh, the answer to this question is mass times some sense of distance squared. And the question that comes up that you have no answer to is what is this distance? Am I going to plug in 0? Am I going to plug in L? Am I going to plug in L over 2? How many people think L over 2 might work? It's some, you know, there are, you have seen many situations where the center of mass actually worked, right? It works when we are trying to figure out where does grav force of gravity act. We can pretend that it's at the center of mass and it works out. I will tell you with the rotation inertia, this is one scenario where it doesn't work. You can actually see it here. So if a center of mass could be used to describe the whole object, this and this would have the same rotation inertia. Because you know, their center of mass is the same, right? But you know from experience that they have different rotational inertia. Yeah. So this is uh, why I want you to take the time to go over this uh, calculational technique. And in fact, this will be, um, so you know, in this class, uh, even though you know, math 3A covers some integrals, we don't do a lot of integrals in this class. You've seen me use integral once to drive a formula, the uh, spring potential energy. This is actually one example that requires use of integral that I'm going to expect you to know how to do on an exam. So, uh, so you know, let me take the time to um, illustrate the setup and actually go through calculation here. I'll do it for one more example um, so that you'll have seen it uh, enough. So. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, uh, problem, the dif difficulty that there is no single distance that we can plug in. And if we were taking a guess, we might have guessed the center of mass. Turns out in this problem, it doesn't work. It doesn't give you the correct answer. So we have to uh, fall back on our default method. And oh, sorry, I call it default, but you haven't seen this yet. So um, I, I should take a little more time to describe it. So you know, this is something you are going to see uh, illustrated more often in physics 4B. That's why I'm taking time to go over this in more detail. So, um, so as I look at this ruler, what I am hoping is I am hoping that this was a point mass, that, if all, that all of this mass was at a single point. Because if that was the case, I know how to deal with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this ruler, break it down into smaller bits, in, in my imagination, not literally, um, so that I can deal with each small piece. So imagine me just uh, dividing up this ruler into tiny little pieces. You know, into tiny little pieces. I won't draw you all. So into tiny little pieces. Let me just draw a piece here that I'm going to use for illustration purposes. But you know, imagine breaking up into tiny little pieces and what I can s say to myself is that I don't know how to deal with the entire ruler, but I do know how to deal with this one little piece. If it's small enough, I can treat this one little piece like a point mass. Right? Let me introduce some new symbols that, you know, that will be useful. So I'm going to call the mass of this tiny little piece dn. Um, it's, you, know, you might have seen this kind of notation in your calculus class before. This is sometimes called, uh, I guess you could call it differential. Um, but I think the term that I like better is uh, infinitesimal. Infinite, wait, infinitesimal mass. As in, this is some quantity that is related to the whole mass but it's a very tiny, very small portion of that mass. Okay, so this is a portion of the ruler has this much mass, and it is at a distance. Let me label that distance x. It is at a distance x, right? 
Do you know what the rotational inertia of this tiny piece of roller is? Do you have a formula for it? Yeah, dmx squared. So now that I can, it's something small enough to be treated like a point mass, I can use this relationship. I can say rotation inertia of this object is equal to the amount of mass it has times x squared. So let me use this notation. So I'm going to write down di, the infinitesimal rotational inertia, or you know, very tiny portion of rotational inertia coming from this, is equal to the small amount of mass that's there times x squared, the distance squared. Yeah. This setup looks OK to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, having said all of this, this is not the question that was asked before, right? The question that was a actually asked was, what was the rotational inertia, not what is the tiny portion of rotational inertia? So how do we go from here to here? Yeah, so this is the integral that you have to do. And conceptually, this is how, how I want you to think about it. I think, uh, um, so for people who have this uh, view of an integral as on some kind of abstract procedure, this is, uh, um, I think, a better way of at least uh, imagining it initially. Um, so you think of this infinitesimal mass as a small amount of mass delta m. Uh, sorry, I'm using delta in a weird sense. but bear with me for a bit, um, and think of this uh, infinitesimal rotational inertia as some um, you know, small but finite amount of uh, um, rotational inertia that you can attribute to this. So let's say small amount of rotational inertia is equal to this small amount of mass times um, x squared. And if you wanted the rotational inertia of the whole thing, what you would do is you would take this piece you would take a piece next to it, you would take the piece next to it, and you would add them all up, right? So for the total rotational inertia, you would simply add up all this uh, with the index going from, uh, let me do the index in a different color. You would add this all up with the index going from uh, 1 to n where n is the total number of pieces you've broken it down to, and this index would specify, um, all right, how much mass is in each little piece, and what is the position of each little piece, right? And this would be an approximation. It would be an approximation of what the rotational inertia of the whole thing is. Because, well, each little piece here, it's still not a point mass. It's a, even when you break this down into 100 one centimeter pieces, each one centimeter piece has an extent of one centimeter. It's still not a point mass. So what do you do that makes this, makes what you calculate an exact number instead of an approximation? So this is what, we'll end, what we will end up calling integral. But how do you go from this summation um, to uh, uh, to try to get something that will be, give you an exact result rather than an approximation. Recall to your calculus class. I still don't remember. Um, <laughs> it depends on who you had as a calculus teacher. But, yeah, what, what goes to infinity? Yeah, you let n go to infinity. So you take the limit as n goes to infinity, and what that means is each tiny piece gets infinitesimally small. That's what infinitesimal means. So you take this limit, and in your calculus class, this is what you covered as Riemann sum. Riemann sum was the approximation to an integral. And when you take the limit, that each small interval actually becomes infinitesimally small, that limit this is the integral. Yeah. All of this coming back to memory from your calculus class, yes, no? Yeah, so um, the reason I'm bringing this up, even though I'm really not going to go through this every single time, uh, having this image in your head is important for doing this very first step. This very first step 
of setting up this portion of the expression that we are going to write down. So, um, so you know, we know we are getting to an integral. So what I'm going to do as the next step from what we have written down here, well, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to integrate this over the entire rod. That's what I'm going to do. But I will tell you this, in physics, when you see integral in physics, the integral itself is not actually the difficult thing. You will see here, it's a simple polynomial integral. Um, someone who was about to fail calculus could do that. It's not a difficult integral. But what is difficult is actually setting this portion up. That's the thing that you may have never seen in your calculus class. That's the portion where you have to look at the setup and think of, all right, I don't know how to deal with the whole thing but I'm going to pretend that I'm going to break it down into tiny little pieces, and I'm going to set up an expression that tells me how to deal with that tiny little piece, and then I'm going to integrate this uh, integrand, this expression, to get me the full result in a completely accurate, you know, um, non-approximation kind of way. Good. Okay, so that's going to be the answer to the original question. So for the total rotational inertia, for the total rotational inertia of, so this would be the rotational inertia of the rod, that's going to be equal to this expression that we have set up. And I have to say, okay, I'm going to integrate this over the rod. So, so far this is all just a symbolic notation, just reminding me what I am going to do. It's like, um, you know, it's like, if you write, write down to-do list for the day, that's sort of what this is. It's like to-do. I have to take this quantity and integrate over the rod. But your to-do list actually doesn't tell you how to do any of the stuff that's on your list, right? So I have to change this into an expression that I can, where I can actually use the integral formulas that I remember from calculus and use it. So when I look at this, um, I guess the first thing to address is what does the integral over the rod means? So uh, what would that look like? Mm. Steven? Um, so it would be over the total distance of the rod. Over the total distance of rod. Um, OK, I like that you are focusing on the distance. Yeah, so, um, so this is the reason I drew this one example piece. I had a parameter that was characterizing this piece. And that piece was this value x, right? It's so like you're trying to characterize people in this class by where you are sitting, right? <laughs> and if I want to add up everything over the class, maybe average your exam scores or whatever, then I'm going to have to add up for the student who is sitting over there, student who is sitting over here, and so on. So I'm going to have to add up x from all the way from x equals 0 to all the way to x equals l. Right? So let me do that. So that's a one concrete thing I can do. Instead of saying integral over the rod, I can say, all right, my integral is go going to go from x equals 0 to x equals l. These are my limits of integration. Yeah. Now, having decided on that, when I look at this integrand, I see that I have some problematic quantities. Um, x, that's fine. I, I will figure out how to do that. Uh, this dn is a bit problematic. So it does indicate uh, you know, how much mass is in this tiny little piece, but it's not indicated in a kind of um, in, a, in a form where I can integrate. Because according to the limit I've set, my variable of integration is x. But this makes it look like my variable of integration is m, which is not even an actual variable. So you know, this dn that we wrote down, it was a symbolic uh, reminder for, to re be re-expressed in terms of this coordinate variable x. So how would I do that? How would I express the small amount of mass here in terms of x? or something that's related to x. In other words, let's say I asked you, I have this ruler that's 100 centimeters long, and I want to have an expression for uh, what is the amount of mass, so let's say this is you know, 100 centimeters, 100 grams. I want to know the amount of mass in one centimeter of this ruler. Yes, Stephen? Oh, I don't know how to answer that 
Yeah, but whatever. Uh, if it's related. So defining the mass in terms of x, we know that for that small mass is multiplied by the total length, we'll get the total mass. All right. Uh, let me write it down. We'll make some corrections. But so your idea is the small mass times the whole length. You want that to be the total mass, right? Something along that line, OK. Um, I said the units here are not quite right. Because this small amount of mass, it'll still be in kilograms. This is still kilograms. This is in meters. But this is the right general idea. As in, uh, you can relate this whole thing to the, um, the whole length. So the first thing you kind of need to do is how to express the small amount of mass that's here in terms of, as a, I guess, a fraction of the uh, total mass. Sergio? So dm times l equals m over l? Uh, no, no, no. That still doesn't give me correct units. So let's go through this step by step. Uh, so uh, so let, let me just go through the example that I was going to go through. I mean, you know, this is something that you already have an intuitive feel for. This is not an actually difficult question. You are just not used to dealing with, with it in a symbolic format. So let me give you numbers. 100 centimeter ruler, 100 grams. If I asked you what is the mass of a one centimeter portion of it, what would your answer be? One gram. Yeah, all of you know the answer to that. It's just that you are not used to expressing it in a symbolic format. So, well, 100 gram to 1 gram, 100 centimeters to 1 centimeter. That gives me some idea. I can express this as a ratio. So, OK, um, 100 grams n over the 1 gram that's in the small portion. So that ratio, I can say, all right, that's equal to the ratio of the length is the total length, 100 centimeter, L, divided by the small amount of length that's here. Yeah, so we don't have a symbol for that yet. Let me introduce a new symbol here. So this would be the symbol for um, how, what's the, the size of this. So this would be the infinitesimal dx. So L over dx. So everyone thinks that this ratio sounds reasonable? Yes. yes. Uh, let me point out one thing. This uh, ratio actually assumes um, one thing. It's uh, kind of easier once I've written it out for dm. So let me do that. So let me solve this for dm. When you do that, you get this. You get the infinitesimal amount of mass. It's equal to the m over l, the total amount of mass, divided by the total length times the infinitesimal amount of length. And the reason I'm going through this uh, circuitous route is because we haven't um, officially introduced this concept yet. This is what you might call density. If you have heard the word density, then you know that's what it is, mass per some spatial extent. Uh, later, at the last week of this semester, we're going to actually do fluids and we'll do density properly. Here, it's like a linear density of the, of the ruler. They take the however much uh, mass of the ruler you have, divided by its length, you get the linear density. And what this expression here is assuming is that the density of the ruler is uniform, that one end of the ruler isn't heavier than the other end of the ruler. So you have a uniform density of ruler. So, um, so yeah, um, so that's the expression we are going to use. And as long as this ruler is uniform, um, the, all of this, it will be fine. Now, what I'll tell you is that the problem that you will be asked to do on the exam, the density of the ruler will not be uniform. And so there, you have to take on, so the symbol that we use for density, it's uh, lambda. That's the symbol that we use for density. Um, and uh, in the exam, what you will have to deal with is where you have to write down the mass of the infinitesimal piece as the density times the length. 
That's what you will have to do on the exam. And this is how I make sure that there will be no memorized formula that you can use for that exam problem. You actually, you actually have to know how to go through this calculation step and actually do the unique calculation for the exam. Like if you're just trying to memorize this, I'm actually going to give you this shit for the exam. And there will be not a single formula here that will answer that particular exam question. So uh, let's wrap up here. So I'm going to use this expression to plug it in here. Um, so let's do that. Um, I don't think I need the thing on the bottom, so let me erase this. I have space for it. Uh, all right. And um, so the next set of expression will look like integral go is with respect to x going from 0 to L. So uh, after I plug this in there, the integral will be with respect to x, which is good. Um, that's how I was planning on doing it. dx times, now what I'm integrating is m over l times x squared. m over l times x squared. m and l are constants. I can pull them out. Everyone here knows how to do this integral? What is the antiderivative of x squared? I'm looking for a simple answer. What is the antiderivative? There's x cubed. What else? Yeah, one third. You just have to have those integration formulas memorized. This is like the simplest integral you covered in uh, Math 3A. It, this is not a difficult integral. So uh, m over l factor dot m over l. And the antiderivative of x squared, as Stephen said, is 1 third x cubed. And to evaluate this definite integral, you evaluate it at the lower limit and the upper limit. It's actually upper limit minus the lower limit. Right? I'm not using any novel notation here. This is something you have all seen in calculus class. Right? Yes, Ali? Yeah. So let me plug this. Oh, when I plug in 0, I get 0. So I'm just going to get what I get with the L. So here, I'm going to get m over L times one third L cubed. So this L will cancel out one factor there. So uh, you will end up with um, one third M L squared. So this is the rotational inertia of the rod uh, when it's a spun um, about the end, about one of the two end points. And this is one of the formulas that you would see in this uh, formula sheet. So when I go here, long uniform rod. Oh, wait, this is through the center. So here it is, uh, long uniform rod rotated about the end. So 1 third ml squared. That's exactly what we derived. Okay. So um, the procedure that you described here is how you go through it. Um, and uh, I want you to have some time to do an example for a two-dimensional case, which I wouldn't you know, ask you to do on an exam. But I kind of see that I'm out of time. I needed to have time to go over some of the other stuff. Oops. Some of the other stuff here. So, um, uh, so let me do it this way. I'm going to I have a list of videos I need to make for this class. Um, I will do this uh, disk one on video. And just to upload it on the course website, you can take a look at it if you want. But the two-dimensional case is not something that I would ask you to do. If you just need to know the answer, the answer is already here. Um, you know, in the textbook, you should actually be able to find how they derived this. But I'll do the example of solid cylinder. That would be the example of this for the um, um, f um, uh, on the video, and I'll upload it so that we don't have to take class time. Um, yeah, so this is a one-dimensional example, and um, I don't know if, uh, I think in the homework set I did put in some portable TA questions that asks you to go through something similar. So, um, so you know, look at that, take a look at that. This is the one question that I tell, you know, every semester that there is going to be a question on the exam that uh, you know, exactly related to the setup. It probably won't be the whole question. It'll be a portion of a question. Um, now, if you are looking to see which part of your homework uh, covers it, let me just try to find the probability question that I put from here. Uh, so it would be, I mean, you know, I'm not telling you that it's the exact, uh, 
it's, it's the exact same problem, but uh, here it is. Um, so question 49, uh, part B, derive the rotational inertia of this inflexible string. Um, that's actually going to be this exact same thing, but you know, in the portable TA. And there's actually, uh, oh, I guess that's it. Wait, is that it? Yeah, so that is it. Um, so what I would, uh, uh, once again, um, ask you to keep in mind is um, be able to do this if uh, the question is changed so that the, the density of the rod is no longer uniform. That be able to deal with something that has a variable density. that variable density would be like, you know, if I said that this ruler is somehow made so that this end is lighter than the other end. And, you know, I would, on a problem I would give you, I would give you what the functional form of this is. And what you would have to do is, so conceptually it's not any harder. It's just that instead of plugging in this for this, you'll be plugging in this for this. So that's just at that one point? No, 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 the, the density is described as a functional, functional position. So, so um, yeah, so the whole point of having the variable density so that if you are planning on simply memorizing formulas, just know that it won't work because uh, the problem is written in a way that there's no formula you can plug in. 